On the night of March 31, 1984, Marvin Gaye Sr. began arguing with his wife, Alberta, over a missing insurance policy. The fight had gotten so bad that Marvin Jr. told his father to leave his mother alone. And after that, the rest of the night was uneventful. The next day, Marvin was lying in bed when his parents started arguing again. And Marvin yelled downstairs and told his father if he had something to say to him, he should come up to his room and say it to him there. But Marvin Sr. didn't come up, so Marvin Jr. yelled at him again saying, if you don't come in now, don't you ever come into my room again. His father finally came up and Marvin was cursing at his father and pushing him out of the room. And they ended up in Marvin Sr.'s room where Marvin started to kick him. And his mother said that she remembered her husband screaming, he's kicking me, I don't have to take this. So she rushed in to grab her son's arm and walked him calmly back to his room. And Marvin told his mother that he was packing his stuff and getting out of the house because he said that father hates me and I'm never coming back. Then Marvin Sr. came into the room with a 38 that Marvin had given him as a gift and he shot his son in the heart. Marvin slumps to the edge of the bed and his father shot him again in the shoulder. Marvin's brother Frankie and his sister-in-law Irene were staying next door when they heard the gunshot. They rushed to the house and Frankie went to console his brother who was clinging to his arm and gasping for air. When police arrived, Marvin Sr. was already waiting for them on the porch. And by the time paramedics arrived at the hospital, Marvin Gaye was already dead. He died the day before his 45th birthday. Marvin Sr. had massive bruising from the fight, so he was allowed to plead no contest to voluntary manslaughter, and he received only five years probation. He was later sent to a nursing home for the remainder of his life, and he died of pneumonia at the age of 84 in 1998. Madame Delphine McCarty LaLaurie lived at the residence with her third husband and two of her daughters. She and her husband were legally separated, but he was at the house that day. And her story is one of the most famous or infamous stories to come out of New Orleans. And for over 100 years, her name has stirred up emotion. Today, she's often referred to as the demon in the shape of a woman. This is the story. On April the 10th, 1834, a fire broke out in the kitchen of the Lallerie residence in the French Quarter. The information released in newspapers of the time was grotesque and is now heavily debatable. When the police and fire marshals arrived and went to the kitchen, they found the cook to the stove by her ankle and later on she admitted that she had set the fire in an attempt to escape. She was afraid that she'd be punished and sent to the attic. The attic was used as a prison. She said that slaves that were taken to the attic never returned. The New Orleans Bee newspaper reported that bystanders attempted to get inside of the attic to make sure that everyone was out of the house, but the Lalaries refused to give them the keys and told them to stay out of their affairs. Because of that, they had to break down the doors. And inside, they found seven slaves, four women, two men, and one of unspecified gender. After the slaves were out of the house, a mob of almost 4,000 angry townspeople smashed the windows and tear the doors down until almost nothing remained. The rescued slaves were taken to City Hall at the Cabildo and given medical treatment and food. Fast forward a hundred years and the accounts of what the police and firemen saw became even more exaggerated for profit. The author of Ghost Stories of Old New Orleans in 1946 is who made the claim that there were people with in their skulls and that wooden spoons were nearby to stir their It's important to note, however, the author never cited any sources for her extreme claims and they've never been corroborated. The story was further embellished in Journey into Darkness, Ghosts and Vampires of New Orleans in 1998 by the operator of the New Orleans ghost tour business. Today, the exaggerated accounts from those books are often used as a source of fact. One thing that we know is true is that one man was so afraid of punishment that he out of a third story window and the window was cemented shut and it's still visible today. There's also the legend of a young slave girl named Leah. As Leah was brushing Madame LaLaurie's hair, she pulled a little bit too hard 
and this caused her to become enraged. And just like the male slave I mentioned earlier, she climbed out onto the roof and Witnesses saw her burying Leah's body and police were forced to find her $300 and make her sell nine of her slaves. She eventually bought them all back. So because of this, her cruelty was exposed and the house had to be rebuilt. Four years later, it was, so the house you see today is a bit different from the original house. In April 2007, Nicholas Cage bought the house for three and a half million, but to protect his privacy, his name didn't appear on the mortgage documents. Two years later, he was having financial troubles, so the property was foreclosed on and listed for auction. Madame LaLaurie became a legend that still talked about on ghost tours, and her story remains one of the most popular ghost stories in New Orleans. She and her driver fled the city, and it's been said they went to Paris, but that's never been proven. Edward McDaniel Jr., 55, and his wife, Brenda McDaniel, 63, were when they returned from walking their dog. She was a former White House nurse, and her husband was an active army colonel, and he was also a doctor. They had a 19-year-old son, and Brenda also had an older son from a past relationship. Two days before their deaths, police responded to a call at their home about a dispute and burglary in progress. It's a developing case, so the nature of the dispute isn't clear, but police believed that it's related to the murders. A neighbor who lives a few doors down said the teenage kids and their friends are bad people and they bring weapons into the neighborhood. Another neighbor was shocked the shooting occurred in that neighborhood but she wasn't surprised about where the crime happened. Another neighbor called in a tip that resulted in the arrest of D'Angelo Strand. A few hours later, Ronnie Marshall was also arrested. Ronnie Marshall and D'Angelo Strand were charged with two counts of second degree murder and two counts of the use of a firearm in the commission of a felony, and they're both being held without bond. The suspects and a family member of the couples are believed to be co-workers. On July 22, 2007, Joshua Komashajewski saw Jennifer Pettit and her daughter Michaela at the grocery store and he followed them home. The next day, in the early morning hours, he and his accomplice, Stephen Hayes, broke into that home. Once inside, they found Jennifer's husband, Dr. William Pettit, asleep on a couch in the sunroom. They b***ed him repeatedly with a baseball bat. His wife and his two daughters were also inside. The men went through the house looking for money. They came back to Dr. Pettit and took him to the basement and tied him to a support pole, and he was still unconscious. They went back upstairs and continued to look for cash. They weren't satisfied with what they found, so they demanded that Mrs. Pettit withdraw $15,000 from the bank. While at the bank, she let the teller know that two men were holding her family hostage in their home. The teller called 911, and the call came in at 921. Stephen Hayes later choked and Jennifer Pettit and her daughter Michaela. Down in the basement, Dr. Pettit came too and he heard his wife being assaulted, so he ran out of the house to get help. He had a very bad gash on his forehead and he was barely recognizable, but he had a rush of adrenaline that he took advantage of and it kept him going. He would end up losing seven pints of blood. He knew that if he didn't get help, his family would be gone. The police arrived a few minutes after the 911 call was received and they set up a perimeter. At this time, they also had the number to the Pettit's house, but they never called. They were there when the house was on fire and even heard people screaming inside, but they didn't attempt to go in. While the gasoline was being poured all throughout the house, the police were outside. All of this was occurring while they were setting up the perimeter. They also watched as the suspects got into the Pettit's car and attempted to drive off, but they crashed into a police vehicle. Joshua and Stephen, they were both sentenced to death, but Connecticut abolished the death penalty in 2015, so they now have life sentences. Joshua had also robbed the homes of state troopers, and he had been arrested for 18 home invasions. Why was he out of prison? He should never see the light of day. Dr. Pettit and his wife Jennifer had been married for 22 years, but fortunately he found love again and was married in 2012. He and his wife Christine had a son that they named William Pettit III, and they call him Little Bill. 
the house was eventually torn down and the Pettit Memorial Garden sits in its place.